We have another space achievement to record. The first close-up photographs of another planet, Mars, taken by the Mariner 4, which is an accomplishment going to go to the United States. And these are some of the very first images taken from the Mariner 4. Of course, it's not the Hubble quality that you're used to, but these are the very first ones way, way back in the 1960s. They're absolutely stunning in their day, and still, for the perspective of what was accomplished, they're still pretty stunning. All right, continuing with the Gemini program, we have the Gemini 5. You want to jot down the astronauts for this mission, Cooper and Conrad. And it's actually astronaut Cooper who came up with the idea for the United States to wear mission patches. So you'll see right here the very first mission patches ever worn for NASA astronauts. And it's been a tradition ever since. All the patches you've seen before Gemini 5 were made uh, after the fact. All right, the goal of Gemini 5 was to spend uh, a record amount of time in space. And in fact, Cooper made these patches eight days or bust, with the goal being to spend over a week in space. A week in space in a tiny, tiny capsule. NASA was not a fan of the eight days or bust tagline. They didn't want people getting caught up on it was the length of the mission that was the purpose. There was an enormous amount of experiments. So NASA wanted that to be the concentration, not the length of time. They were worried if they didn't go for the more than seven days, the eight days or bust, that the general public would view the mission of failure, even if all the experiments and objectives of the mission had been accomplished. The amount of time that they put into space was 7 days and 22 hours. That's pretty much 8 days. And this was the first time the U.S. crewed space mission held the world record for duration. Longest amount of time in space for one mission. And the former Soviet record was 4 days. Now, mentioned some of the experiments that the Gemini 5 crew did. There was a lot of investigation into vision for the astronauts as various astronauts reported uh, difficulties at times in a mission with their vision. So they started doing lots of uh, recording of information about the vision of the astronauts. Here's a look at the right side of the capsule under normal vision and sometimes astronauts reported experiencing bouts of tunnel vision and they thought maybe a result of oxygen poisoning or of the high gravitational forces experienced. Some other astronauts also complained about having uh, these little dots that would appear or streaks. Now it wasn't a constant thing, but it was uh, occurring to enough astronauts that it was definitely worthy of further investigation and try and pinpoint a cause to then be able to eliminate this for future missions. In November of 1965, France becomes the third nation to enter the space age. They launched a rocket from French soil. So we'll go to page 43, and we have space agencies. We are now adding CNES, the French equivalent, if you will, of NASA or the Soviet space program. And they were established in 1961 and you just saw launch their first rocket in 1965. The Gemini 7 mission, now for those of you who can count, you're thinking 5, 7, 6 should come after 7. You'll see why uh, 6 and 7 are actually a joint effort here, so we're starting to work on this goal of rendezvousing, meeting up with another space vehicle. Just so happens 7 launched before 6. 6 was to launch before 7. Uh, things in the world of rocketry don't always go as smoothly as you like, so 7 was launched and then 6 was launched. So the crew of Gemini 7, Frank Borman and Jim Lovell. We'll just need Borman and Lovell. And let's just take a look at this, my friends. 14 days, 2 weeks in this capsule. I don't care how well you think you can get along with someone. That will really uh, put a strain and put a test on things. 
The original patch, that was the Space Foam patch, did not have the surnames of the astronauts. This is a later version. This is representing an Olympic torch to honor the fact that they were going on a marathon mission. As you know, there is this uh, fun side to NASA where the backup crews love to have fun with the patches and photos. So here's the prime crew and the backup crew. Uh, funny hat day. And then the backup patch. Need a light, Frank and Jim? Because Ed White and Michael Collins were ready to go. The backup crew always wants to be the prime, prime crew, so they're ready to light that uh, Olympic torch for them. We'll point out the highlights of the Gemini 7 mission along with the Gemini 6 mission since they were together. The Gemini 6 crew, Wally Shira, one of the Mercury astronauts in Stafford. The A in their patch is signifying the target vehicle that they will rendezvous with. The 6 here, and then the stars kind of highlighting places in their rendezvous maneuvers. Those of you who have had astronomy in the universe might recognize the celestial sphere right here. Checking in on the navigation skills. So this outer ring is the Gemini 7 awaiting the launch of the Gemini 6 crew to follow, as it says here, very intricate paths to be able to rendezvous with the Gemini 7. In order to appreciate why the Gemini mission was so focused on the rendezvous, the ability to dock with another vehicle in space, we have to fast forward look at the Apollo space program, the mission of NASA that followed Gemini. And the whole mission focus of the Apollo program is to land on the moon and successfully return to Earth. So we're going to show you a, a clip here of why this rendezvous is so important and how it came to be. American engineers needed to carefully answer a basic question. What is the best way to land a human on the moon? Early on, two options or modes were being considered. The first, direct ascent, would use a single spacecraft and a single rocket. The second mode, Earth orbit rendezvous, would also use a single spacecraft, but called for two smaller rockets. One rocket would launch the spacecraft, while the second would send up fuel. The astronauts would meet up with the fuel tank, fill up their spacecraft, and head for the moon. If the United States was to reach the moon first, NASA had to make a careful choice. In 1959, an engineer named Dr. John Hubbolt was adamant that both options would fail. In both plans, the same spacecraft that was designed to launch successfully from Earth would also be required to land on and take off from the moon. Hubbolt was convinced that this spacecraft was much too large. It was a vehicle about the size of an atlas. Down at the Cape, it takes 3,000 men, a launch pad, and a launch facilities to get an atlas off the ground from the Earth. They were going to land something the size of an atlas on the moon backwards with no help whatsoever. I thought that was preposterous. Hubbolt suggested a third mode, lunar orbit rendezvous. The key to this approach was to capitalize on the weaker gravity and lack of atmosphere on the moon. The main spacecraft would not go down to the moon at all. Instead, the astronauts would taxi down to the moon on a separate lander vehicle that would be lightly built and specialized for takeoff and landing on the moon. Sometimes we call it the bug, sometimes we call it the lunar schooner. But the idea was that we go there, we would land with the small lander, but keep the command module in orbit. After we explored, we'd take off again, make the rendezvous again with the uh, command module, dispense with the lander because it's done its job, and then we'd return to Earth in a very normal way. Hubbolt was convinced his plan could get America to the moon safely and more efficiently. But many at NASA opposed the idea. Uh, I remember expressions like, this is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard of, the most unsafe thing. How could anybody go up there and land and rendezvous 250,000 miles away? 
After two years of frustration, John Hubble risked his career and wrote directly to NASA Associate Administrator Robert Siemens. And it was a blistering letter. And I first thought, well, I wish that guy would get off my back. I mean, uh, he, I, uh, maybe I should call his boss, uh, the director of the laboratory, and tell him that, you know, you're not really supposed to cut across, I don't know, six or seven layers of management that way. And, uh, but I thought, well, he's, I think he may be right. In July 1962, NASA announced America would use the plan championed by John Hubble to reach the moon. Right away, NASA began construction of a lunar lander. Overcoming gravity on Earth takes an enormous amount of fuel and an aerodynamic design. But the lander would never have to fly on Earth, so aerodynamics were not a problem. The main concern was weight. For every pound of weight that was brought down to the lunar surface and then back up, you had to add three pounds of rocket propellant. So it was a four to one growth factor on weight. We went back very painstakingly through everything. For example, the skin, the aluminum alloy skin of the crew compartment was about 12 thousandths of an inch thick. That's equivalent to about three layers of Reynolds wrap that you would use in, in the kitchen. The lander's exterior can be extremely lightweight because the moon has no atmosphere. And all of a sudden, the motions of everybody came through. They all got up and clapped. Von Brown was sitting right in front of me. And he turned to me and he, with an OK sign, he said, thank you, John. That's the biggest compliment I've had in my life. It would definitely be quite a compliment from Werner von Braun. Now, uh, would you ride into a vehicle that was the thickness of three pieces of aluminum foil? food for thought. So this is uh, Dr. John Hobolt. That's the name you want to jot down, but the very famous image. Hobolt. And these are some images from the Gemini 7, Gemini 6 mission. The very beginnings of Google Earth. This is uh, looking out from the Gemini 6 craft, showing you the Gemini 7 craft. And by the way, they're only about 9 feet apart in this photograph. So, the first orbital rendezvous. Parallel flight. They didn't actually dock, but they are incredibly close to one another here. So orbital rendezvous. That definitely goes to the U.S. Now there's also a first here with the Gemini 6 and 7 rendezvous. It's not one that I added to the list. It's the first time a musical instrument was played from space other than the human voice as an instrument. See if you can identify either the song or the instrument. It was Jingle Bells played on the world's smallest harmonica, the Little Lady. And on their advertising packaging for their harmonica, they have this great little picture played here. And speaking of music in the space program, now that we're spending days in space, there is this new tradition that uh, begins with wake-up calls that uh, every morning the crew is woken up by a particular song. Sometimes it's chosen by mission control. Sometimes family members submit these to be played for their family member aboard a space mission. And the Space Rock NASA website is where you can look up where all of the wake-up calls uh, for past missions have been. 
The most frequently played song over all the missions for Wake Up Call is Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers' Free Fallen. And free falling back and safe to planet Earth are our Gemini crew members. The first soft landing on the moon was done by Luna 9. Here's the uh, look at the moon surface back in 66. And airbags were used to cushion the landing of this vehicle. And this achievement went to the Soviet Union. The first impact on a planet, Venus. This is the Venera 3 vehicle. And this achievement also goes to the Soviet Union. The Gemini 8 mission was crewed by Armstrong and Scott. They were doing uh, many experiments with uh, light and also vision. And so we have this very classic physics image of light being passed through a prism. So you can see the individual colors. So you have the two for the Gemini and then the five, one, two, three, four, Gemini eight. And the little fun backup photo. We were continuing practicing rendezvousing, but this time with the Agena target vehicle. Good close up there. And here we have the first orbital docking between two spacecraft, where the Gemini 8 vessel did indeed dock, link up with the Agena target vehicle. And that accomplishment is for the United States. In our Alpha Mix appendix, you'll have this Vox, the voice operated switch exchange. Mentioned this earlier, but just wanted to re highlight it quite literally there. So, reminding you of how the NASA families could listen in to the various aspects of the mission. And the mission became quite harrowing when the capsule just began to tumble, just spin violently out of control for a very long period of time. And Armstrong was able to very skillfully bring that capsule back around to be able to land safely. This image from the Life magazine shows Mrs. Armstrong in both sorrow and relief when Armstrong and Scott were able to safely return from their Gemini 8 mission that was cut short due to some technical problems. Wonderful sight to see the astronauts uh, safely recovered by the Navy Sealmen, sometimes affectionately referred to as the Frogmen. The first satellite to orbit another celestial body, uh, the being the moon, was Luna 10, 3rd of April, 1966, and in a similar way in which Sputnik by the Soviet Union was the first satellite to orbit our Earth, they also have the accolade of the first satellite to orbit another celestial body. Penultimate Gemini mission on this column, we have Gemini 9, Stafford and Cernan. And they are the first backup crew to become a prime crew since Carpenter replaced Slayton. And it's a rather tragic reason as to why the backup crew became the prime crew. Rather tragically, on 28th of February 1966, the test pilots and Gemini astronauts of C and Bassett unfortunately were killed as their plane hit the side of a factory. So they both unfortunately perished. There is a memorial for them at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Headstones for where they're buried in Arlington National Cemetery. So Stafford and Cerner, Cernan become the prime crew. And there is a bit of a hiccup as they attempt to dock with the ATD, which is the Augmented Target Docking Adapter. So kind of a mock experience of docking with the lunar module. And so mission cut a little bit short. Safe splashdown and good recovery of the vehicle. The capsule itself is on display in the Kennedy Space Center. Not a great photo, because I took it. 
Ah, there you go, professional quality photo. Gemini 10, astronaut Young and Collins. Astronaut Young was one of the first people, along with Grissom, to fly aboard the Titan Gemini capsule. The Gemini 10 patch gets a lot of attention over the years because of its simplicity. And it's one of the only patches that you could do a 180 with it and it would look very similar to its regular position. Two stars emphasizing the Gemini mission and Castor and Pollux, specifically what the stars are. Here's a great overlap, frame by frame, of the dropping of the gantry arm to launch the Gemini 10 mission. And that's the Agena test vehicle. They achieved the notoriety of the highest photos of Earth taken by humans at 185 miles up. There you can see successful docking with the target vehicle. Splash down, great recovery. And then you have lots of debriefing after missions and sharing insights with science teams. And here is Young talking about uh, his tethered EVA. Although at a quick glance, it almost looks like John Young has uh, chalk laser eyes. And the penultimate Gemini program mission. This is a Gemini 11. Conrad and Gordon. And you do want to write the 850 miles because that is the highest orbital achievement, or altitude, I should say. The patch is navy in blue color and gold because they were two naval officers and the colors of the navy being blue and gold. Now, do recognize that the 11 here is showing this great altitude achievement, but it's largely exaggerated. If the Earth were about that size, then just kind of a little blip above here would be the 850 mile mark. But we definitely want to emphasize the great accomplishment of this mission. It's the highest orbit ever reached by a manned spacecraft. Here you can see the work of docking, EVA, and Gordon's spacesuit is on display or flight suit rather, is on display in the Seattle Air and Space Museum. And let's bring it on home with the final Gemini mission, Gemini 12. The two astronauts for this mission are Lovell and Aldrin. Their mission was originally slated to launch on 30th of October, where in many places that's considered Halloween, with the colors here emphasizing the Halloween colors of orange and black. And the crescent moon shape here to recognize that now we're moving on to the next phase of the NASA program of Apollo, of actually going to the moon. And then the 12, and the Gemini capsule pointing to the 12 as it's the final hour of the last mission for the Gemini program. And here we have the backup crew kind of egging on the prime crew that they want to go. Trick or treat, Gordo and Jean, Eugene Cerndon and Gordon Cooper. Here's Buzz Aldrin on an EVA. Now in your notes it says Edwin Aldrin perhaps if you wrote the first name. He did have his name legally changed to Buzz. And he loves this photo, and he declares it's the first ever space selfie back in 1966. So there's Aldrin wearing his first space selfie. Nearing their splashdown. Great shot of the Navy rescuer. And here's a look at all of the 12 launches of a Titan rocket. Remember, the first two were unmanned. Food for the Gemini program got a little bit better than the Mercury, but still has a long way to go before people uh, crave space food. And as we wrap up the Gemini program, you can see the astronauts, some of the Gemini astronauts, wrapped up in the parachutes. Again, participating in that survival training, that's essential. And here's a great historical photo. You've got Ed White, Gus Grissom, 
And you definitely recognize this gentleman by the side of his face, his ear, and his cheek. That is Yuri Gagarin. So as part of the worldwide blitz of Gagarin touring the world. And this is Sergei Korolev, the lead engineer, mission controller for the Gagarin and many other missions. When discussing manned space missions, the two American programs that are the most talked about are the Mercury and Apollo programs. One program that does not get as much attention, but which was instrumental in getting man to the moon, was Project Gemini. The Gemini missions flew between the Mercury and Apollo programs and allowed astronauts and planners to practice many of the procedures that would be important for future moon flights, paving the way for man to walk on the moon. Early in January of 1962, Project Gemini began. Because of the large time frame between Project Mercury and the Apollo flights, it became clear to NASA officials that more training in spaceflight was necessary to get men to the moon and back safely. Unlike the Mercury capsule, which could only hold one astronaut, the aptly named Gemini capsule could hold two astronauts and could be maneuvered in space by the crew. The ability to maneuver in space allowed astronauts to train for space rendezvous and docking. Learning these procedures would be critical to successfully return from the lunar surface and docking with the command module in lunar orbit. Gemini also needed to provide useful information about how the human body and man-made equipment would respond in the harsh environment of space. Up to that time, no one knew exactly what would happen to astronauts after being exposed to long-term microgravity. The program would consist of 10 manned missions, all of which were to be completed in 12 months. After two unmanned missions, the first manned mission, Gemini 3, was launched on March 23, 1965. The flight was a complete success, proving how easily the astronauts could maneuver the craft. The flights that followed all saw success as well, including the first American spacewalk on Gemini 4 the first docking with two vehicles in space by Gemini 8, and a long-duration mission which lasted 14 days by Gemini 7. With the final flight of Gemini 12, all of the major objectives were met, as well as many other mission objectives. With all the critical theories tested and proven, it was time for Apollo to go for the moon. The 10-manned Gemini flight spanned 603 days and accumulated over 1,940 man-hours in space. Of the 20 astronauts who trained for the Gemini flights, 15 of them went on to subsequently fly on Apollo missions in the lunar program. As the successes grew in Project Gemini, it became clear that man could, should, and would fly to the moon and back safely, making history in the process. And so the Gemini mission, here's all of the individual missions on this 50th commemorative patch, 50 years. And we have just about 1,939 hours logged for the Gemini program.